Guess who's in Lotus Land? It's a Hollywood affair. Hollywood's most horrible crime. I'd like to see them fall on their knees and beg for forgiveness. It's been 20 years since the murder of Sharon Tate and her friends, but still the battle goes on. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry it doesn't come close to me. In memory of Sharon. Ricky, what happened? 18 years old is awfully young to experience the finest years of your life. He was the golden child of America's most wholesome TV family. But in the end, it was all taken away. The tragedy of Ozzy and Harriet and Ricky. It's double trouble. Readers of Playboy saw what she looks like naked, and she didn't even pose. Although you don't really look alike, we're still different. The twin sister of the Playmate of the Year. Hello, everyone. I'm Ari Povich, and welcome to this special week of A Current Affair in Hollywood. It was in one of the most exclusive sections of this city, a bizarre and brutal crime that changed the way Hollywood sleeps at night. It was the night that Charles Manson's crazed followers murdered their way to infamy. But, would you believe it, Charles Manson is up for parole again this year. Sadie came running out of the house, and she said something like, I lost my knife, give me yours, and something like that, and I gave her my knife. And next thing I know, a man comes walk, stumbling out of the house, um, covered in blood, and um, falls down and text starts stabbing him. Those are chilling words. They come from the lone voice heard following the most macabre series of murders since Jack the Ripper. She is Linda Kasabian, now living on the run. Linda was once in the grim spotlight. She was a woman who turned state's evidence on the murderous Charles Manson family. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry it doesn't come close to me. Linda Kasabian was there on that night of terror, August 9th, 1969. She accompanied three other Manson family members on their blood rampage. Do you ever want to see Charles Manson or any members of the Manson family again? I'd like to see them fall on their knees and beg for forgiveness. It was a mass murder that former Los Angeles DA, Vincent Bugliosi, can never forget. He prosecuted Charles Manson and his cult of killers. He recalls their preoccupation with death. We enjoy killing. As someone who knows Manson better than I, uh, a member of the, of the Manson family, as he said, death is Charlie's trip. Manson spoke constantly of, of death. Uh, he said he'd rather kill a human being than a bird or even a rattlesnake. And they already had plans, as you probably know, to murder prominent personalities who, to Charles Manson, symbolized the entertainment industry. Sinatra, Liz Taylor, Stephen Kling, people like that. Their life, their life was murder. Susan Atkins equated stabbing a human being with sexual intercourse or going in and out. This is the house that Sharon Tate called the Love House. It sits on a hillside in L.A.'s exclusive Benedict Canyon. I had been there eight months earlier to interview Sharon and her movie director husband, Roman Polanski. She was then in a beautiful bloom of life. I would next see her and her friends in a coffin. The memory haunts me to this day. Four of the Manson maniacs drove up secluded Cielo Drive in an old Ford. One of them, Tex Watson, got out and he climbed a telephone pole. He severed the wires. Already, it started to sound like a horror movie. Now, the four of them feared that this gate here was electrified, so they climbed over this embankment and swarmed into the Tate household with commando-like precision and proceeded to rewrite criminal history in blood. Once over the fence, the killers saw headlights. Tex told the girls to hide in the bushes. Stephen Parent, a 19-year-old friend of the house's caretaker, was going home in his car. Parent was in the wrong place at the wrong time. When the car got right up to us, uh, Tex jumped out, shot the person in the head. Then Tex broke in a window and opened the front door for the girls to enter. Linda Kasabian, a Manson family member, could not go through with what was about to happen. She waited outside. It was like, not real. You know, did this really happen? It just didn't seem real, but it was real. Once inside the house, Charles, Tex Watson, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Susan Atkins discovered Wojtek Prakowski asleep on the living room couch. 
He awake and startled. He asked, what time is it? And then, who are you? What do you want? Watson replied, I am the devil, here to do the devil's business. Patricia Krenwinkel from Los Angeles. She was a, uh, as a child, a, a bluebird. She sang in the church choir. At one time, she wanted to become a nun. Susan Atkins and Patricia Krenwinkel rounded up the rest of the people in the house. They were Abigail Folger, heiress to the Folger coffee fortune. She was Wojtek's girlfriend. And there was Jay Sebring, Hollywood's trendy hairstylist. He was a friend of Sharon's. And there was Sharon Tate herself. Tex Watson ordered them all to lie on the floor. Sebring protested loudly, saying that Sharon was pregnant. Watson replied by shooting Sebring through the heart. Watson then tied a rope around Sharon and Abigail's neck. Tex Watson then calmly ordered Susan Atkins to kill Wojtek Fakowski. She didn't get along with her father, and she gravitated to San Francisco, became a kept woman and a topless dancer, later a gun mall. Certainly couldn't categorize her background as being out of America. Wojtek Fakowski broke free of his bonds and began to struggle with Susan Atkins. She began to flail wildly at him with a bayonet, stabbing him several times in the legs and body. Tex Watson moved as he saw Fakowski racing to the door. He shot him and then bludgeoned him with a gun butt as Fakowski fell into the yard. Watson uh, was a high school uh, star in basketball, football, and track. I think up until a couple years ago, he held the high school high hurdle track record in the state of Texas. Uh, they viewed him as the all-American boy. In the fracas, Abigail managed to untie the rope around her neck. Krenwinkel grabbed her and another struggle ensued. Tex Watson had come to Krenwinkel's aid. He put an end to the struggle by stabbing Abigail. Watson then ordered Atkins to kill Sharon Tate. Meanwhile, although mortally wounded, Abigail Folger had somehow crawled into the yard next to where her boyfriend, Frakowski, had fallen. Watson and Krenwinkel then proceeded to stab the already dead Fakowski and Folger many times. Susan Atkins, meanwhile, left a one-word message written in Sharon's blood. Following the sickening slaughter, the killers stole off into the night. The following night, Manson killers struck again at the home of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca, killing the innocent couple in an equally senseless rampage. Thinking that the Tate murders were drug-related, police thought they had a copycat killer on their hands. It was almost unbelievable because it was more like a slaughterhouse. It, uh, normally, if you can call any homicide normal, you're going to find a body or maybe two bodies. And uh, again, normally they're going to be confined to a particular space. But this was bodies everywhere. It just uh, was almost unbelievable. The slaughter triggered a mass nervous breakdown among the Hollywood colony. But still, they turned out in full force for Sharon's funeral. Last thing she made was not a very happy experience for her, but her greatest picture she was doing was her pregnancy. I never seen a woman more preoccupied with it. The trial of the Manson family held a nation spellbound in horror with details of depraved orgies. Doris Tate, Sharon's mother, attends all parole hearings for Manson family members and campaigns to make sure that none of them ever see a day's freedom. But already they have a freedom in jail that boggles the mind. California has conjugal, <clears throat> pardon me, conjugal visitation rights. And this will bring uh, the man's wife into the, the uh, prison. And from those con conjugal visitations, Watson has had two children. Are you telling me yes, that I Tex am? Watson, the man that led this grim commando team, has conjugal rights? Absolutely. What is your finest, happiest memory of Sharon? I, I cannot. Allow myself that privilege. Now, when we come back. Playboy got double exposure when it picked its Playmate of the Year. And later, the real story of Ricky Nelson. He was the star child of TV's most normal family. So how did it go so wrong? Tonight, a startling look to the keyhole at the Nelson house. We're here poolside at the Playboy Mansion in Beverly Hills. 
And the latest woman to make a big splash is Renee Tennyson, the new Playmate of the Year. But that's making ways for her sister back home in Boise. You see, she's a mirror image of her pinup twin. It's the ultimate act of public exposure. Taking it off on the pages of Playboy. Literally bearing it all for all the world to see. It's the kind of concept that never really appealed to 21-year-old Rose Tennyson. Because, you see, Rose is a rather modest young woman from the conservative area of Boise, Idaho. A good church-going town that doesn't even allow the showing of X-rated movies. But now suddenly, Rose Tennyson feels she's been stripped bare of all her small-town value. To say nothing of her privacy. No, Rose has never posed for Playboy... But someone who looks exactly like Rose has. And when we say exactly, we mean exactly identical, as in twin sister Renee, who's not only posed for Playboy, but was also recently named 1990 Playmate of the Year. But all of that's making life a little difficult for poor sister Rose. Because back home in Idaho, with its rather straight-laced reputation, not everyone seems to know, according to Rose, that it was not Rose who struck that rather provocative playboy pose. No one can ever say that to me, because it's not. You feel a little vulnerable as a result of that? A little exposed? We're two individuals. Although, you know, we may look alike, we're still different and... And it doesn't change the fact that she posed and I didn't. She's the one in the magazine. <laughs> you think that uh, you think that some people have mistaken you, though? That they think that it was you that did that? Oh yeah. I never would have thought that me or my sister would be the first black playmate of the year, or even in Playboy. But the question remains: How does this religious country girl feel about her mirror image? becoming the hottest Idaho export since the baked potato. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. It's hotter than the baked potato. It's been fun. Get a lot of attention. She's sometimes nice. In fact, so nice that Rose herself is now considering shedding a few petals for Playboy, perhaps in a future duet with her sister. For apparently, this religious young woman believes it's no sin if you pose with your twin. Do you think that someday we're going to see uh, Renee and Rose together? Yeah, in the near future, you probably will. The twins? Yeah. <laughs> now wouldn't it be something if Playboy found a triplet, huh? Now when we come back, the true story of what happens to Ricky Nelson. <laughs> Today would have been Ricky Nelson's 50th birthday. He grew up in this house. Middle America, right smack in the middle of Hollywood. Ozzie and Harriet's son was born with it all. But when he died, he had nothing. Our Raphael Abramovich has the sad ballad of Ricky Nelson. Back in the days when television was black and white and life seemed a lot more simple than it appears now, I used to watch a television show called The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. America's favorite pancake mix presents... The Nelson. With Ozzy, Harriet, David, and Ricky. I don't know what the original plan was, but before long, little Ricky was the star of the show. Not only that, but he went on to become a movie star and a rock and roll idol. And then he started slipping, and the slide never stopped. The man at the computer is Joel Slavin. He may not look it, but rock and roll is what he lives for. He's a pop music columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, and if anyone knows the inside story about Ricky Nelson from top to bottom, he does. Rick was playing a character on TV named Rick Nelson. His father wrote the script and defined who Rick Nelson was on this TV show, and then when the lights went off on the set, he turned around and told Rick, you have to play this character when you get home, too, because you're a role model. And there's 40 people that work here, and their livelihoods depend on you living up to the character I've created. Now, this is an 11, 12-year-old boy. Now, I didn't know that when I first came across little Ricky back in the 50s. All I could think about was, gee, what a wonderful life this spunky little kid seems to have. 
He was so real. He wasn't a kid star. He played himself. His name was really Ricky Nelson. His father was really Ozzy. His real mother was Harriet. And David was really his big brother. And everybody who watched the show knew it. And for me, at least, it made a lot of things kind of blurry. Ozzy's behavior on the show and Ozzy's behavior off camera, two different things. Ozzy was a very intense man. He had facial tics, you know, like this, uh, off camera. The guy on camera, that affable, uh, bumbling, gee whiz kind of guy, that was a figment of his imagination. That was his character. Had me fooled. I think they fooled a lot of people. Everybody wants to believe in Ozzy and Harriet. They want to believe that that's the way that family was. Um, people who knew them wanted to believe that that's, that way it was. And I think that the family probably went into their act the minute a fifth person showed up on the scene. And it was a very convincing act. I remember watching the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet and wondering why my life wasn't like theirs. They seemed to have it all, and all of it was so effortless, easygoing, wonderful. The TV show had nothing to do with the lives that David and Ricky were leading as teenagers in Hollywood. According to Slavin, Ricky was into drugs as early as 1961, and Harriet Nelson, the quintessential TV homemaker, wasn't all she appeared to be in those aprons she made so famous. Of course, they had servants waiting on them, which the servants don't show up in the TV show. Um, Harriet is perpetually in an in a apron on the TV show, a different apron every show. Uh, when she wandered into the kitchen at home, she wondered, what's this room for? I mean, this is a lady who grew up in hotel rooms. She knew nothing about cooking. But the real shocker in Slavin's book has to do with Ozzy Nelson himself. There's plenty of evidence that Ozzy had his affairs. This is, you know, uh, from talking to sources of, uh, around the TV show. It seemed to indicate that Ozzy uh, partied around. I thought he was always hanging out with Thorny. <laughs> Well, there was no Thorny, uh, or the, the Thorny in real life, Ozzy wasn't friends with. Um, no, Rick used to tell people that his father dated a lot of the girls on the uh, show. According to Slavin, as early as 1956, Ozzy Nelson, the businessman, the producer, the director, sensed the coming of the age of rock and roll and pushed his son Ricky into imitating Elvis Presley on the show. Ricky was an instant success. In 1958, Elvis was in the Army, and Ricky Nelson was the top rock and roll star of the day. He was on the cover of Life magazine. He was the biggest attraction on the concert uh, scene. He was the most played artist on the radio. He was the biggest selling recording star. You know, I remember watching that show and him, you know, moving into rock and roll and playing the guitar and so on. And I always thought it was a setup. I always had the feeling that he had been created. People tend to view Ricky as Fabian, some kind of contrived, manufactured, you, you know, rock star for teenagers and for, and for dumb teenagers that don't know the, the real thing. Uh, and undoubtedly, that's where he started in business. And the guy doing the creating was Ozzy Nelson. But Ricky was a person who loved that music. It was his escape valve. It was the way he got out of the tension, the pressure, and the resentments that he had surrounding that show. Slavin, who's an expert on rock and roll, says that for a while Ricky was right up there with the very best. That Ricky's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was something he truly deserved. But rock and roll for Ricky became more than the music he loved. In the 70s, Slavin claims Ricky turned to cocaine. After a while, the fame vanished, and so did things took its place. But Rick would come home from concert tours and go into his bedroom and not come out. That he wouldn't see his own kids would be living in the house with him, that the only time he might come out of the bedroom is to grab a quick cheeseburger from the kitchen. He never ate anything but cheeseburgers and Snickers bars. Sounds like Elvis. It does, doesn't it? Getting up at 6 o'clock at night, uh, keeping the uh, windows to this panoramic view that Errol Flynn had built in 1941, the windows covered in tin foil and newspaper. Ricky's father, Ozzy, had created the perfect kid and the ultimate teen idol. And until he was 18, Ricky played his life as director. Fame came early and fortune came easy. At 30, when his trust funds paid off, he was worth $4 million. Five years later, he was stone broke. He lived out his life chased by his mounting debts, playing to people who remembered him from his days of teenage glory, singing his heart out in places that appeared mostly on local maps. On New Year's Eve 1985, he burned to death in a fiery crash. According to the autopsy report, cocaine was in his system. If he were alive today... It would be his 50th birthday. When we come back, the mysterious death 
of TV's most lovable bimbo. She was a ditzy blonde with a lot of heart. So why did she have to die? Carol Wayne, Johnny Carson's ditzy blonde sidekick, drowned mysteriously off the coast of Mexico. Was it an accident, suicide, or murder? The mystery of Carol Wayne. That's tomorrow in Hollywood on A Current Affair. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Until next time, America.